Hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the What the Research Says. I will drop this class if you are the spy. Teaching Information Literacy with Tabletop Games webinar with Carl DiNardo, Assistant Librarian for Biological Sciences and Chemistry at the University of South Florida's Tampa campus. My name is George Bergstrom, and I'm the Southwest Regional Coordinator for the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. I'll be the question moderator today. Today's webinar is co-sponsored by the American Library Association's Games and Gaming Roundtable. I'd like to start off the webinar with a few quick announcements. To register for other webinars or other trainings available from the Professional Development Office, please see the Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found on our website at www.in.gov library. This session is one hour, and so you'll receive one LEU for today. If you're watching the archived recording of this webinar, the instructions on how to obtain your LEU are available in the video's description on YouTube. Or you can also find the instructions on the Indiana State Library's continuing education site under the LEU policies. I will now turn the presentation over to Carl. Great, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for uh, attending today. Um, uh, before we jump in. I also I also want to thank the uh, Game and Gaming Roundtable uh, and you personally, George, for uh, kind of inviting me to, to talk about something I really enjoy talking about and, and I think about a lot. And um, uh, that's that's always a lot of fun for me. Uh, and I know people who attend these types of things tend to be interested in the same uh, kind of thing. So uh, hopefully that's fun too. And we, we get some uh, good interest and participation. Um, I am going to uh, endeavor to share my screen and um, and from that kind of launch right into it. And I am open as I'm doing that. I am open to uh, uh, questions as we go. Um, and um, I'll certainly uh, work to have time for questions at the end uh, in discussion. Again, I really do enjoy uh, talking about this and um, it's a lot of fun for me. So with that, let me do this and real quick, make it as big as possible and uh, just set up my toolbar a little bit. I am going to try to keep the chat open so I can see that, but I might miss it. So I appreciate you watching out for me. Um, okay. Uh, well, that is not the start, but uh, let's go back here. So yes, thank you. Welcome. Uh, my name is Carl DiNardo. Uh, I am a research and instruction librarian at USF. Um, that's fairly recent for me. I've been here for about a year. And uh, prior to that, uh, uh, where I really cut my teeth, uh, not cut my not cut my teeth, but uh, I really um, came into my own, I think, as far as finding my stride. Uh, in teaching at a small liberal arts college in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, it's Eckerd College, and uh, a lot of what I show you today is like born of uh, some of my experiences there. Um, so uh, let me get right into it. And uh, that really is a place that I was able to find my voice as a teacher. I think I was a pretty good teacher. Uh, uh, prior to starting at Eckerd, um, but I felt comfortable exploring things both in uh, kind of a typical one-shot setting um, in uh, at, at that institution. But beyond that, I was afforded the opportunity to create a, uh, a course level information literacy, like credit bearing course. Um, that was kind of simultaneous with uh, work I was doing. I was part of the information literacy uh, framework task force. Uh, so I was kind of working with some amazing people, amazing minds, thinking about how we 
uh, might uh, look to push push how we thought about information literacy and make it a little less prescriptive and all of the sorts of things that that we were endeavoring to do with the framework. Um, those things kind of coalesced uh, with just many and and varied interests that I have. I consider myself a maker. Um, the the photo here right now that you're looking at is uh, part uh, was was kind of uh, the climax of the first chapter of a long running D and D game that I have, and almost everything. Boy, I'm going to have to make my own DM screen because almost everything you see in this photo it, uh, are things that I made, including the uh, the gaming table that we play at. Um, so I really enjoy the idea of process. I really get enthused about uh, a lot of a lot of things, and um, yeah, uh, that, that's a lot of fun for me. Uh, that being said, uh, I have been thinking a lot about. Uh, tabletop role-playing games and what we can and do learn from those. But what we're talking about today is going to be more in the uh, kind of tabletop, like board, card game, uh, and that sort of thing realm. Though, I will point out that when we're talking about games, a lot of these things can apply to uh, the idea of games in general. Um, so I also don't like to be bored in my classroom. And that kind of led to the question that I had for myself of, uh, can I use games, which I am interested in clearly, uh, to teach? Um, and I will point out that as we run through this, this isn't necessarily like the, the timeline of how things happened, because uh, if we went with the timeline of the stuff that was going on in my brain as um, the person I'm married to would attest to, that would make no sense to anyone. Um, so I'm going to run through kind of a, a thing that kind of makes sense. And uh, from from there, uh, I can I can kind of answer questions about like what really went down. Um, but let's start with the question, uh, what is a game? As it turns out, this is a deeply problematic question. But what I would really like to do is give you guys a moment to just um, you don't have to define a game. Uh, you can take a stab at it if you'd like, but in the chat, just uh, what comes to your mind when you think about uh, games or a game? Um, uh, kind of in service to this idea of what is a game. Uh, I see a set of rules, strategy, fun way to problem solve, ordered play with roles and rewards. Uh, play with parameters, structured play. A lot, of, a lot of this idea of of there's some type of of governing rules or structures, objects that we play with according to a set of rules, problem solving. I love all of these. Uh, escape from life in a fun way. Uh, uh, so, so I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot uh, of of ideas that that are around the idea of like fun or entertainment. Um, and, uh, oh, crunch. Oh boy. Uh, that's a special, that's a special type of game near and dear to my heart. Uh, the crunchy games. Um, and, uh, a little bit of the idea of problem solving and a lot of this idea of like this set of rules. Um, so it's a little problematic. Um, and here are a couple, uh, well, there's a definition at the bottom, uh, but before that, this uh, this reference is kind of is from a chapter in a book. I, I have uh, my references at the end, uh, but it's uh, both of these are from different books on game design, and this particular chapter by Bond uh, looked at a lot of uh, published definitions throughout history and kind of concluded that this is difficult and that it really can mean a lot of different things uh, to a lot of different people, a lot of different times. And part of that is, uh, what is a game from the perspective of the player? What is a game from the perspective of uh, a game designer? Um, maybe what is a game from the perspective of a teacher? Uh, that wasn't in that chapter, but I'm kind of throwing that out there. Um, and uh, another uh, a game design book uh, is by uh, Jesse Schell, 
Um, and uh, he writes that a game is a problem solving activity approached with a playful attitude. Um, this can be a problematic definition uh, because it's so broad, but that's also why I love it so much. Um, and some of you hit on this idea of problem solving, uh, the idea of activity and the idea of play. Um, and I think those things are uh, important elements. Um, so the next question, right? Well, can we learn from games? Yes, we don't we don't need to belabor this. There's a, a lot of literature, a lot of uh, psychology literature uh, on play that absolutely that is uh, a, a deep part of how humans learn and develop. Um, for example, uh, I can look at my game collection and this is not at all all of it. <laughs> uh, and it is, I, I, I took this photograph just the other day and it, it I didn't like pretty it up, obviously. <laughs> and it is just a mess of uh, games. So I have learned that I have too many games because I don't get the opportunity to play all these games, uh, especially the crunchy ones, um, uh, all that often. Uh, I am thankful that I do have a, uh, an every other week d and session, but part of that has meant that I don't get to play some of the strategy board games as much. And uh, absolutely yes to the uh, Gloomhaven. Um, it is a, a, a real thing to me that I have uh, my, my uh, d and group. They are uh, deeply strategic miniature type players. And D and D is not a great strategy <laughs> type game, uh, and Gloomhaven is a much better game for that. Uh, but they're also amazing role players, and I love them very much. Um, so we can learn from games, even if it's that we have too many. Uh, but what can we learn from games is maybe a more uh, salient question, um, and this is a big question that doesn't have a clear, definitive answer either. Um, and I think part of that stems from uh, we, there's always new things to learn. Um, and so how we get at those things uh, through games um, can be uh, an interesting question to, to ponder. And it really is the question that um, is the heart of what, what we're uh, talking about today. So that's too big. Let's narrow it down a little bit. Uh, so can I teach, or can we teach, I'm sorry, can a game teach information literacy concepts? Uh, I think that's a more manageable question. And there are, in fact, games that have been created to do this very thing. Um, an example I have here is a game called Goblin Threat. Um, it's an online game that was designed by a co-author. Uh, uh, she and I wrote about uh, a lot of what we're talking about today uh, in an article um, in uh, Reference Services Review. And uh, uh, long prior to that, she had developed this game uh, at Lycoming College. She's not there anymore, uh, but they, not only do they still use this game, um, and I cannot remember the date. I want to say it was something like 2008 or 10. It's, it's not new, <laughs> uh, but Lycoming is still using this game. Uh, I see somebody in the chat knows it. Uh, yeah, it is a classic game. And, um, and uh, I, I, think, I think, well done. It gets to the thing it needs to get to. It's campy. It's fun. Um, but she refers to these types of games as, uh, uh, as broccoli, right? These games that um, we're going to talk more about uh, what's called serious games, but these are games that are designed to teach something, right? And part of the idea is that, or a part of what we, she and I had talked about uh, is, um, and I should mention her name, uh, is Mary Broussard. Um, what Mary and I uh, had talked about quite a bit is a lot of the games that are designed specifically to learn is kind of like trying to get a child to eat broccoli. Like, yeah, there's nutrition there, 
Um, but the whole time they either don't want to do it uh, or, you know, they're just kind of doing it because the parent is making them do it and that sort of thing. Um, and so we we speculate that that um, that there's maybe uh, better ways to uh, dress up the broccoli uh, or uh, maybe maybe uh, find a way that is nutritional, but maybe not broccoli. I don't know. This analogy kind of gets wild at a certain point. Um, so the next question is, uh, I love cheese so much. Uh, the, the next question is, can a game teach information literacy concepts if it is not explicitly designed to do so? So goblin threat is explicitly designed to teach about plagiarism. Um, so that's a more interesting question to me. Um, it's more manageable of a question. Um, and I think it can, right? Um, obviously, that's what we're doing here. So there's an important reason I think that's a, a, a question to ask. And that is that uh, the the idea of serious games versus what's known as commercial off the shelf games. So uh, games that you might buy explicitly to, as uh, many of you observed, have a fun time. Um, I like to think of games as potential experiences to have, and those aren't always necessarily fun. Um, there's a really important game by uh, somebody that I respect very much, a game designer I respect quite a bit. Uh, her name is Brenda Romero, um, and she designed, uh, well, a series of games, but one of them in particular, particular got her a lot of notoriety. Um, the game is called Train. Um, it's not to be confused with the commercial off-the-shelf game, Train, uh, or something like Ticket to Ride. It's not that vein of game at all. In fact, it's, it was more of a it was more of a, an experiential art piece um, that had a lot of meaning. meaning. Um, her name is Brenda Romero. The game is Train. I encourage you to, to look it up. You're probably going to see that she is uh, uh, somewhat recently, this, within this year, uh, been in the news because of uh, a very popular book right now. Um, uh, I believe the title is Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, something like that. Um, where uh, the protagonist in that book uh, seems heavily based on her and her work and not attributed, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I encourage you to look her up and look up that game uh, because it is really important and it is decidedly uh, not fun, uh, but meaningful. Uh, so games can be meaningful. When... I think of games, I think a lot in terms of uh, two different things. These aren't the only things that define games by any means, but uh, the idea of uh, the theme of a game and uh, the mechanics or mechanisms of a game. So theme referring to what is the game kind of about? Um, and so if we if we look at to the right here, uh, the, the game Ticket to Ride, uh, that's a game that is about trains and building, uh, you know, a little uh, building railways across in on this map uh, across the United States. Um, there are European maps. There's other many many versions of Ticket to Ride, but they all have the same type of theme. Um, the theme of tri Twilight Struggle is the Cold War. Um, those are the ideas behind those games. Um, the mechanisms or mechanics of the game are basically the rules. The, the, like once you take everything but the rules away, um, those are the, the, the mechanics of a game. So another way to think about this, an important way I think to think about this is what the game is asking you as a player to do. Um, and we'll, we'll definitely be circling back to that. Um, so this idea of theme and uh, mechanics in a game uh, is important uh, for uh, reasons as far as like selecting a game that you might you might use to teach. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that a little more in just a second. Um, the other uh, like kind of uh, 
bifurcated designation is this idea of serious games versus commercial off the shelf games. So when I uh, am, the, the work that I've done with this, I tend to focus on the mechanics of the game for commercial off the shelf games. And the reasons for that are, it's my thinking that uh, commercial off the shelf games uh, have a different design uh, uh, kind of guiding principle than serious games. And that because that's the case, the game might not be designed in terms of the theme in a way that is useful to learning something. I'll just use the examples that are on the screen right now. Ticket to Ride, the theme is railway expansion, basically. Um, in no way is that game teaching you uh, railway expansion or the history of railway expansion or um, you know, how, to, how to, you know, be a, a, a designer of mass transit. None of that is true in terms of what you're learning in that game. You are learning other things in that game, just not what the theme is. I'll compare that to Twilight Struggle, which I think is one of the most brilliant um, combinations and, and marriages of mechanisms and theme. Um, with Twilight Struggle, you, I mean, you could willfully not do this, but you kind of will start to learn about the history of the Cold War as you play that game, uh, just because of how it's designed, uh, marrying so well uh, with the theme of the game. Uh, the, the mechanisms, what the game is asking you to do, builds so much stress and tension into every move you make. Uh, and if being stressed out isn't uh, reflective of the Cold War, I, I don't know what is. Um, and uh, that's just amazing. And you can learn about it through the theme of the game. So uh, the primary design focus of serious games uh, is to generally teach you a thing or maybe some things. They're, they're, that's the guiding principle of those games. Um, so the guiding principle of Goblin Threat is to teach you uh, about plagiarism, right? That's the first thing. Now, hopefully, we'll be able to make this fun when you when you design those things. But that's that's a serious game. Commercial off the shelf games, right, are generally designed to enable some type of experience, often a fun experience. And the thing that I didn't type here, but is uh, true, is to sell games. Um, not that serious games uh, can't be big business, but uh, commercial off the shelf games tend to be designed to move games off the shelf into as many uh, people's hands as possible. Um, so let's look at each of these just a little bit closer. Uh, a question becomes, can you just make a serious game fun and resolve the issue? I think Goblin Threat does a decent job of that, but the whole time you are kind of still like, I'm learning a thing. Um, and to me as a teacher, that can be a little bit problematic because I don't want the focus to be, all right, I'm learning a thing. I want the focus to be the uh, experience and then can we learn from that experience? So the primary design focus on commercial off the shelf games, um, is designed to enable some type of experience, often fun, as we said, but um, is there learning happening? Um, and the answer, again, is yes, because these, these parameters, these rules, these mechanisms, um, as you tr interact with them and test them out and pull some levers and push some buttons, um, you're, you're learning how to, to work the game and you're, you're getting better at working the game. So you are learning something. Circle back to my, my question. That's the point of this whole thing. So if you're learning something, uh, can these commercial off the shelf games be used for information literacy, literacy instruction? Um, uh, absolutely, George, yes. Uh, you have to learn better critical thinking in 
a lot of games. Also, I love games. Um, I am, and I love crunchy games. I am not the best at them, but I really like, I really like interacting with them. Um, so uh, that's a great segue to this slide, um, which is that uh, the idea behind information literacy and can we teach with games? Um, well, most games re re like have some information uh, requirement and, and decision making uh, that they, they depend on information. Um, and uh, um, oh, I, I appreciate that comment, Rivka. Um, uh, so what I mean by this is there's a pretty pretty big spectrum as well. And games like chess, checkers, um, or if you're into more modern games, Food Chain Magnet, uh, are open information games. Everybody can see everything that's going on on the table out in front of them. The only thing that you might consider hidden is what it, are the other players thinking, right? So these are open information games. You, you see what's going on versus hidden information games where uh, you, you don't know uh, anything uh, at the start of the game at least. Um, and the goal of some of these games is to gather information. And there's a whole spectrum in between. Um, there's other, like these are, this is by far not the only, there's so many design uh, making decisions in games uh, in terms of like luck versus uh, absolutely no luck uh, and that sort of thing. But what's interesting to me is this idea of information and information is so key to so many games. There has to be, there has to be a way to incorporate that. So that led to my huge question that I uh, uh, kind of uh, foreshadowed before, or I think stated explicitly, is what is the game asking me as the player to do? What are, what are the requirements of the game? What are the rules of the game, the mechanisms of the game? This question goes deeper than that, those rules, however, uh, and gets at the idea of where I think the learning happens in these games. Um, so this is a, a, a not great written rule. If I was writing a rule set, uh, the, I'd, I'd reword this slightly, but I, I worded it this way just to have an example here. Uh, so let's, let's pretend the rules say something to the effect of uh, roll two six-sided dice and move the total number of spaces shown on the dice. Exactly. Uh, not maybe not everyone. I don't want to assume everyone's played Monopoly, but a lot of people have. This is exactly what is uh, being asked of you as the player to do in Monopoly. Uh, so it sounds pretty familiar. Okay, I've rolled two dice here. Uh, one says five. One says two. If I do some math, that's seven. Uh, and then I'm asked to do some counting from a starting space to a landing space. Boom, 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 there we go. Uh, so I've been asked to do several things in this um, one rule. And these are all things that uh, this game is teaching me. So uh, depending on where you are on a learning spectrum, um, this, this might be teaching you to add. And I, I, do, I do understand that math and like counting is math. Uh, I, I do understand that. Uh, the word like math or mathing uh, as a catch-all is funny to me. So uh, we're doing addition here, right? Um, we've rolled two dice. We get, we get seven uh, if we add five and two. So this can teach, uh, uh, this can teach people um, math. This can teach people addition. Um, if uh, you have somebody um, who is maybe, uh, this could be one die as well. It could teach numbers, the number five, what that number looks like. Um, uh, this can teach somebody how to count out five or seven spaces. Um, or um, uh, Travis Willingham, uh, you, you all can't see it, but I do have a critical role shirt on right now. Um, and uh, 
the, the counting, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spaces, uh, and then a landing space. So this game in that one rule is teaching players something. And uh, other games, we, we use Monopoly as an example, other games might have more decision making going on. So it might it might matter what number you're rolling and maybe what path you take. So maybe you get interested in what are the chances that I roll a seven uh, versus uh, I need to roll an 11, right? So just playing this game won't necessarily teach you statistics, but it can lead to an interest in those types of things as well. Um, and so we could see, all right, well, it's really no surprise that I rolled a seven. That is the most probable number uh, uh, that, that I could have rolled um, uh, statistically. 11 would be pretty, pretty difficult. Uh, and Rivka, Rivka calls out a, a game that uh, uh, would be great for probability. Um, and I, I'm unfamiliar with uh, Space Base in particular, but yes, there are certainly games uh, that, that do that. Um, so if I'm looking at this, I, I like to use this as an example. It's one that a lot of people can grasp onto and uh, is, is really useful uh, as something that I am going to uh, come back to uh, at the end of uh, this talk. That brings me to the resistance. Um, if you are unfamiliar unfamiliar with the game, the resistance, it is a, a class of game that is uh, kind of widely recognized uh, as social deduction games. Uh, the idea that there are uh, of all the players, most or all uh, don't know. Uh, the role and or abilities of the other players in the group. Um, so uh, this is, uh, yeah, they're also known as hidden identity or hidden role games. Um, and this is uh, the first game that I uh, tried out in a classroom setting uh, as far as a commercial off-the-shelf offering. So, uh, Again, we can we can talk about like what my brain was actually did and how I got here. But if we use this as the example, uh, we need to ask what is being asked of the players. Uh, they're being asked to figure out who the spies are. Um, so in a six player game, two of those players will be spies. They will know who each other are um, or they will each know who the other is that they're both spies. Um, and the other four players uh, only know that they are not a spy, that they are part of the resistance. That's all they know. They get a card, um, the, the cards with the, uh, the kind of blue fist, that's the resistance. Uh, and that's all they know. They don't know who anyone else is. And their goal uh, I'm going to I'm going to kind of leave the the spies off to the side here for a second but the goal of all four of those players is to figure out who the spies are before the final round um or before um uh, they lose uh whatever that final round becomes uh because the goal for both sides is to either uh is for each side to get three successes or one side to get three successes before the other side uh, gets their three successes. Um, this is played out uh, via missions. I don't need to get into the minutia of how this works, but it's played out via missions. Uh, it is fairly straightforward. Uh, there are actions that players can take in the game in terms of voting who should or should not go on a mission. Uh, and then there is the opportunity that the spies have to make a mission fail. Only the spies can do this, uh, and they are not required to do this, so they can obfuscate a little bit. Um, so kind of circling back here, the resistance players are really trying to figure out who those spies are, because if they can figure it out, they can, they can not put the spies on the missions, and they can win the game. Uh, well, how are they doing this? They're doing it 
by gathering information. Um, they can uh, look at body language. That's certainly something we all kind of do on a subconscious level all the time. Uh, the, the entire game, people are making arguments. Uh, they're, they're laying out logic of why they're not the spy or why uh, this other person is. Um, and some of those may not be as logical uh, of arguments. And that may be indicative that someone is a spy, or it might just be that they're not good at making logical arguments. Um, so that's interesting. Um, there are direct choices that you can watch players make. So are they voting for uh, a particular person uh, or, uh, or uh, not a person, uh, but are they voting for a particular group to go on a mission or not go on the mission? Um, so there are some direct choices and uh, you do get to see if a mission succeeded or failed based on the cards that were put in when the mission was attempted. And there may be zero, one, or two fail cards in, uh, in that mission. Uh, if there are two fail cards, you know that two of the people that went on the mission are spies. That's a lot of information, uh, at which uh, is, I kind of jumped ahead here, the outcomes of those choices, right? Um, and I've kind of arranged those bullet points in kind of a, uh, we'll call it uh, fake news to peer review type of <laughs> quality of information. Uh, the body language arguments thing, like that can be obfuscated. This like body language is maybe not the best thing to go off of. People just get nervous in these games and so on and so forth. Um, arguments people make, like somebody that's good at making arguments, logical, uh, they can they can really like lay it out there for the other players, like why that person is definitely the spy. Um, but it can be a little sus. Um, and then we get to the choices players or players make. And that is a little more interesting because you can see that a player voted for a mission or rejected that mission. You can see uh, the 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 that uh, the, that's the the main choice that is like really seen in this particular game. Um, and you can see then the outcomes of those choices. Did the mission succeed? Did the mission fail? How many fails were in the mission? Who was on that mission? And that's much more concrete information. Um, and uh, I see a couple other uh, versions of this type of game in the chat. And uh, yeah, there are so many, so many. Uh, they are very popular at parties. And uh, let me tell you, uh, <laughs> college students with this type of game, uh, amazing amazing just on the whole uh, not everyone loves this kind of game and we'll get to that in a second too so uh that's what's going on this is what i saw in this game and thought you know i have i'm telling you this this is something i uh i, I kind of broke a rule um that uh, of good teaching uh kind of to to prep students for what you're going to learn right I explicitly decide I, I don't do this. I don't do that with this type of, of teaching uh, because I want the students focused on the experience. I don't want them to be, it's the whole idea of not putting a commercial off the show. Or I'm just sorry, not putting a serious game in front of them is that I want them immersed and playing in a real way. I don't want them thinking about what am I learning here? Um, and so I didn't tell them this, but but this was kind of uh, to to launch them into uh, a section at the very beginning of the, the course on information searching behaviors. And I wanted them to reflect on this a little bit. So with that, I just decided to do it. So this is how I learned to stop worrying. And I made my students worry instead. Um, this was, again, just to kind of lay out where we're at here, this was a full information literacy course. We played this the second meeting of the class. Um, 
And I gave them homework on that first day. Uh, I assigned a couple of, uh, I assigned one video that was a, a nice how to play type video. Uh, I also uh, did like a soft assignment for um, a, a, a group. Um, uh, Will Wheaton had a series uh, where, where he would get uh, players together um, and play, you know, uh, some popular games, and this was one of them. And I, I said, you know, they could they could watch that. Uh, yes, George, tabletop. Thank you. It was escaping me. Um, and uh, it, they could they could if they wanted to watch people playing this game and maybe get some ideas of like how that game. Uh, played out. This, I think, is key if you're going to try to do this type of thing, whether it's for information literacy or just to play a game. If you can prep people uh, with with a quick video, it really enables um, your your teaching of the game to flow much more quickly, much more smoothly. Um, and that's what I did. I did a quick rules refresh when uh, on the day of the game, um, and then we just jumped into it. And before we get to this idea of the end of the game, let me tell you a quick story of what that experience was. This was a very small, small uh, class size. It was the first time I had introduced this information literacy course at the college. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of watching my time here. Uh, first time I introduced this at the college and uh, I had done this prep work. And uh, so there's only, I think there were five students and myself in that first run. Um, one of my students came to class so nervous. Uh, I mean, he was into it, but he, before we did anything, he was nervous and he said, he said, I am, I am terrible at these kinds of games, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it was kind of in a funny way, everybody, uh, everybody was like ready to do this. And the first thing you're asked to do after you, you get there, you shuffle these kind of roll cards. And the first thing you do is you're, you're dealt these cards. And then you just in secret find out if you are the one of the spies or if you are uh, part of the resistance. And as soon as he looked at his card, he kind of just couldn't keep it together. And he's like, just made some like, I don't, I don't know, funny noise, like, oh, you know, something like that. And everybody just started laughing because everybody knew he was the spy. It just even before anything happened, everybody knew he was a spy. So uh, we started playing the game. Um, and, uh, part of that, part of the game is you, you kind of close your eyes, um, and, uh, th th then it's, there's a signal for the spies to both open their eyes. And so they know who each other, each, they, they each are, um, and you, you know, hopefully coordinate, but you don't want to be obvious about it. Um, the at the end of that game, it got a little heated and a lot of people uh, were heated in a good way. Let me let me say that a lot of a lot of the students were really uh, it took a while to come to the realization that the the student who kind of like made a noise when he looked at his card may not have been the spy. Not everybody was on board with that. And it came down to the final round. It went all the way to the end. And uh, this is the second day of the first time I was teaching a four credit course. Um, and one of my students looked me in the eye in that final round uh, as they voted to uh, put me on the mission, voted approve for the mission. She looked me in the eye and pointed at me and said, I will drop this class if you are the spy. And I was totally the spy and uh, the, the spies won the game and it was hysterical. It was amazing. Um, and this is a great thing about great games is uh, not only do they uh, offer interesting decision making. They usually have some time, type of climax. Uh, Amber, 
she was my best student in that class. She ended up getting into gaming. Um, she, she, um, I can't remember the game she bought, but she, she bought a game like during the course of that, uh, of that semester and, uh, brought it to me so that I could borrow it and try it. And, uh, uh, and, and Rivka, like you have hit on, uh, something that's coming up, I think in the next slide, uh, we ended the game. I assigned a reflection paper. This is where, like, I asked them guiding questions, things to think about. This is where the learning happens, right? I wanted them to think about what was good information, what was bad information, uh, and, and reflect on that. Uh, and then uh, they came back to class the next time, and we had a discussion about it. And, and this was amazing. Uh, I'm not, I have, so I've had a lot of really great opportunities in teaching. and. Like I have been 70, 70 feet underwater diving with students and sharks. And I put that moment where that student pointed at me and said that equal with that is like best moments in teaching. That was like so, so good for me. Um, and uh, yeah, so what did we get out of this? Um, the, uh, Rivka pointed out this engagement. I had my students hooked for that entire course. There were there were other things we did with games, you know, uh, here and there because and then I realized like, oh, this works, um, and and they understood me and the and the context I was approaching it from, uh, and it broke down a little bit of that that student professor kind of barrier that happens. I mean, I I had a student threatening to drop the class because she was so into it. Um, this was uh, it was certainly fun. It provided a lot of drama in the class, but very low stakes drama, um, which is always uh, always interesting. Uh, but in terms of those low stakes, it also created a little bit of an environment, right? Where it was uh, where mistakes weren't just okay, but kind of part of the point. Like I wanted them reflecting on bad information that they were acting on. Um, and it, it made that, I think, a little bit easier. Um, it set, up deeper conversations for the upcoming topics in the course. Um, there's, uh, if anybody's familiar with the Big Lebowski, um, there's a there's an article by a few uh, a few librarians or a couple librarians uh, that teases out the information searching behaviors of the characters in the Big Lebowski. Uh, we watched that film and we we read that paper and we, and the entire class, um, they or the entire course, they were going back and using examples in the game uh, to define things and, and contextualize things that we talked about later in the course. Uh, this, was, this was an amazing revelation and experience for me. Um, and I think these are things that are uh, reasons that like you might approach this. However, um, there are uh, challenges uh, to this and maybe reasons you don't want to do that. Uh, yeah, so I, I am going to wrap this up pretty quickly here. Thank you for the, the shout out there, George. Um, you do want to watch out for mis misconceptions, right? Somebody, uh, uh, one of the times I've done this, uh, people, people kind of rely on, oh, I have really good intuition about people, so I was able to read them. Um, and these are important to address in like the discussion phase, and there's other things that you can bring to kind of highlight those things. Really important, something I've been thinking about a lot is that students have uh, preferences that uh, might be uh, either like difficult for them or reasons to avoid this entirely or provide an alternative for them. And that is, uh, I don't like games. You, you, you might be able to get around that. Uh, students who are introverted, this is this is a tough thing for them, but they they also, one thing I found uh, because they often aren't as vocal as other students, um, can be good at these games as well. Um, and, but I think one of the big ones with some of these, this is one, my, uh, uh, my wife hates these types of games because she doesn't like the social contract that you're sitting down, uh, to lie to each other. Um, that's, that's a difficult thing and she doesn't like that. And that's, that's fair and important to really think about. Um, from a from really practical standpoint of putting a course together, this is a lot of work and time to do well. 
Uh, it can be very expensive. This was a small class. I've done the, this type of thing with bigger classes, though. Um, and so uh, if you buy a lot of games, the cost can be an issue. Uh, I'm going to run quickly through how can you do this or should you do this? Really important, play more games. You need an awareness uh, of games and what they are and what those mechanisms are. So a facility with it. Um, and, and knowing that a game like Really Loud Librarians is not going to be a game that teaches anything about the library. Um, you really want to know what you're teaching and have facility with those uh, with those ideas, right? Uh, that way you can look at games and their mechanisms and understand uh, that, uh, that there's um, possibly a connection there. Uh, do you have the time, money, and buy-in to commit to using this as a teaching tool? That's a huge, huge barrier. Um, I'm kind of trying to learn how I might fit this in in this position at USF. This is a huge institution. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out my path there. Uh, other examples of this, uh, I've used two rooms in a boom, another uh, hidden information type social deduction game um, that, that's good for larger groups. Uh, the concept uh, is, is a great game for like conveying uh, coding, decoding information, um, and kind of a team building thing, as well as Forbidden Island. I've used this in conduction, in conjunction with uh, an environmental studies professor uh, uh, to, to look at uh, working together to accomplish a common goal. Um, so what's next for me with this? I've learned that this is not uh, intuitive for a lot of people. So um, it is difficult to not think about the, what the game's about and think about what is the game trying to teach us. So this is not an intuitive thing. Um, and that presents, the, I think, the biggest barrier for librarians that want to do this. So for me, what's next is can I lower that barrier, barrier a little bit? And I'm going to circle back to this. What is the game asking me, the player, to do? Because that is the thing that leads to the learning in my mind. Um, and that has led me to this hypothesis. If this simple example is true, we know a game with this mechanism can facilitate math, learning math and counting, uh, and so on, that we can probably identify other mechanisms to teach other specific things. So I'm trying to relate that. What are the mechanisms that can library that I can put out there and say, librarians look for this mechanism because you can use it to teach this other thing. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I'd love to have your questions. I see a bunch in the chat. And uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to like run through the chat here. Let me check the time here. So we have seven minutes. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm also going to stop sharing my screen. Here we go. All right. So. Rivka asks, uh, one of the things that they love about games is they create community. Did you find that in addition to the critical thinking skills they were simultaneously developing, uh, their soft skills were acting more like a group? Uh, hold on one second. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get rid of a thing here. Uh, in addition to uh, critical thinking. Did they start acting more like a group? Ah. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to assume you meant through the course and not just specifically in that game. Um, I would say that they were at least comfortable acting as a group. Um, I don't know that I was looking specifically, um, at the, the, the like group dynamics. So I don't, I don't want to like stand up here and say, yes, it absolutely, absolutely did that. Uh, I think it really can do that. I think, um, I think some, not all, uh, cooperative games really present that opportunity. Um, and I, and, um, I think there is, uh, a, a work being done. There are people thinking about that exact thing. Um, and, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not like huge into like, corporate world where you're kind of forced to do certain things. Um, but I think uh, the corporate world uh, has been using some games that way as well. Um, um, so Beth asks, do you have any thoughts about gaming in one shots and or standalone events? 
Mm -hmm. okay. I don't think that they could call a game session a workshop where they are. Um, yeah, so I have done this once or twice, and that was in uh, conjunction uh, in a one shot, like going to another's classroom. And um, that one, they kind of heard about what I was doing a little bit and were interested in that. Uh, it was a longer class. It was one of those that was like uh, two day a week. And it was, I think, an hour and a half. And we did the same thing. Uh, we, I said, well, we could we could get at some of these concepts um, and doing you know X, Y and Z. And we did play two rooms in a boom um, and kind of the similar. Uh, give them the assignment to like look at a, how to play type thing. So I have been able to get it into a one shot. I think that really depends on a, a lot of trust with, uh, in my case, that faculty member. Um, th this certainly applies to other disciplines as well. There's a lot of room for uh, uh, language learning with a lot of uh, a lot of these games, and uh, I've worked with uh, uh, language faculty um, on on that as well. Um, so. Those things can exist as, as a one shot. It can be difficult, uh, be, be, I think, because of the length of time and discussion that I, I place importance on it on that way. But it absolutely can happen. Um, uh, Rivka's second question, do you find competitive games and collaborative games to have different effects? Yes. Um, I, in terms of like a group dynamic, um, competitive games, uh, I mean, are, I think most people are more familiar with, and that can lead to uh, some like uh, angry moments. Uh, I think you have to be careful in selection of games because of that. Um, collaborative games, however, aren't immune from that. Um, there's something that's uh, colloquially, colloquially known as, um, uh, alpha gaming, right? Where one person, like usually somebody very in intensely strategy oriented is like, no, this is the best, you know, and different cooperative games try to get around that in different ways. Uh, so that is something to kind of, kind of watch as a facilitator of a game. Um, but a lot of times people find that because they are working together, that is more of a comfortable space for certain people. Um, so uh, I, I think that does uh, affect how people approach them. Um, yeah. Then we have, uh, do you have any tips about teaching games? Multiple people. Oh God, have. so many tips. I, uh, uh, I, uh, I haven't done anything with it, but I, uh, I'm sitting on a, a web space called teachingtabletop.com that um, I kind of had thoughts of reserve or that the reason I reserved it is to like get at those things really quickly. You really need to know the game inside and out. Uh, secondly, uh, for, for new players, first playthrough, don't get hung up on the rules. Like, uh, if you get too like focused on rules, uh, that, that really bogs things down. Um, thirdly, don't just absolutely kind of goes with the first thing I said, but don't pull out the rules and start reading them to your family on game night, like uh, classic, classic mistake. Um, everybody checks out. Um, and, uh, I have a lot, a lot to say about that. <laughs> yeah. But that would be kind of look quick too. Um, teaching games, uh, somebody else interested in the same, I see. Um, uh, and, and maybe, maybe we can talk about that like after, after session, I don't know what. So let's see, it is basically 11 o'clock. I have dropped the LEU form in the chat. Be sure to fill it out if you need, and obviously feel free to sign off if, uh, if you have somewhere to go. Um, I think we've answered all of the formal questions. Juniper uh, has a really, I'd like to call this a yes. really good observation there. Um, and I kind of rushed through some of this, but this is exactly the kind of thing uh, that I was talking about. Uh, and this is important, uh, games aside, this is just important in teaching and really understanding who your learners are um, and being, being 
open and having avenues for those learners if they don't fit like the mold of what you've cast um for for the course or the class yeah yeah and and there are a few games that i am on the tip of my tongue but can't remember their names so i will definitely get those and distribute them when i send out the recording link and leus and all those other things so i will uh, definitely include those but basically it's games that are designed for younger children um again pattern matching identifying you know if if the clue giver says one thing and then you have a, a list of choices in front of you you know mat either you matching to that clue or you trying to guess what they're they're conveying those all do really well at that and i I can't remember if this game was nominated for a Kinderspiel a few years back or not, but it was definitely highly talked about when it first came out. And I believe uh, the game night folks who are behind uh, their they, uh, work with BGG and they did a playthrough of it for sure. And I think some others talked about it as well being really good for those on the spectrum. Um, so I'll definitely dig that up for you all. This is uh, an, an, another, uh, just another quick thing. Uh, at the at the start, I said, you know, I, I've been doing this more with like board games, card games, that kind of thing. Um, but I have been thinking a lot about what we learn uh, or can learn uh, from role playing games, and that is vast. That's a that's a hard thing to think about because there's uh, like so much opportunity there. Um, and I know others have kind of studied this, and I haven't like done hard study on it, but what what's been really interesting to me um with with role playing recently uh and dnd even specifically um has been uh not library related at all uh but like the 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 chance to be able to in a in a safer space like work on emotional intelligence um and really like you know, it, it, ha it has to be it has to be that everybody's on board uh, with with those things and making mistakes and learning from those mistakes and like uh, being being kind to each other in the game uh, if if that's part of what you're what you're doing um, and like role playing games offer a lot of uh, I think fertile ground for for teaching and learning. Yeah. Hundred percent juniper, yeah. All right. Well, I would definitely like to thank Carl for being here today. Thank all of you for joining us. Um, I am going to go ahead and stop the recording.